to announce the arrest of a suspect for the murder of Akia Eggleston and her unborn child. Through the partnership and collaboration of the Baltimore Police Department, my office, and our federal law enforcement partners, on Tuesday at 4 p.m. in Muskegon, Michigan, officers arrested Michael Robertson for the murder of 22-year-old Akia Eggleston and her unborn child. On May 7, 2017, Akia Shante Eggleston was reported missing by family members after she failed to appear at her baby shower. For several hours, friends and family unsuccessfully tried to locate the 22-year-old, who was eight months pregnant at the time. The last time anyone reported seeing Eggleston alive was on the afternoon of May 3, 2017. Supported by interviews, financial records, telephone records, and social media communications, law enforcement has reconstructed a detailed timeline of Eggleston's last days, which include the following facts outlined in the statement of probable cause. Eggleston was excited to be moving in with the father of her child, Michael Robertson, who was in a relationship with another 22-year-old woman that had recently given birth to his second child. At 12.42 p.m., on May 2, 2017, Robertson sent Eggleston photos of an interior of an apartment townhouse via Facebook Messenger and commented that they were blurry and he would resend them from his phone. On May 2nd, at approximately 1.24 p.m., Eggleston purchased two money orders totaling $450 from a Royal Farm store in Baltimore using cash obtained with, via ATM withdrawal for her, from her savings account. At 1.41 p.m., Eggleston sent a Facebook message to Robertson writing, I called you, I got the money order. At approximately 3.45 p.m., Robertson searched, where can I cash a money order in Baltimore, Maryland, from his Google account. At 4 p.m. on May 2, 2017, Wells Fargo bank records placed Eggleston in the downtown area of Baltimore where she unsuccessfully attempted to withdraw cash twice from an ATM. She was simultaneously texting back and forth with Robertson. According to the cell site data and employment records, Robertson was at work at a job site in Washington, D.C. at least as of 6.30 a.m. on May 3rd, the day of Eggleston's murder. He and Eggleston exchanged text messages throughout the day. On the afternoon of May 3rd, Eggleston was seen on bank surveillance video at approximately 12.52 p.m. depositing the two orders, money orders, as well as a paycheck from her employer at a BB&T bank in downtown Baltimore, where she maintained an account. The total of the deposit was $572.42. Eggleston then made a $450 cash withdrawal from that same account. On May 3rd, at approximately 3.45 p.m., a Lyft driver picked up an individual later identified by the driver as Robertson for a ride request by Lyft user Akia Eggleston. This location is a short distance from Robertson's place of employment at the time, Federal Interiors Group, and approximately 10 miles from Eggleston's residence. At approximately 4 p.m., the Lyft driver dropped Robertson off one building over from Eggleston's residence in Cherry Hill. Analysis of call detail records and cell site information indicates Eggleston's phone was at or near the residence between 3 and 4 o'clock on May 3, 2017. Those records further indicate that at 3.43, a short time after Eggleston booked the Lyft ride, Eggleston's cell phone received an incoming call from the Lyft. Analysis of call details and call detail records and cell site information for Robertson's phone indicate his phone was at or near his place of employment at 3.44 on May 3rd when he received a 58 call from Eggleston, 58 second call from Eggleston. This is the last contact between Eggleston and Robert, Robertson's phones on May 3rd. Robertson's next voice call occurred at 534, at which time his phone was located near Eggleston's residence. Based on the call records and the lift records, investigators believe Eggleston and Robertson were together at her Cherry Hill residence during the late hours, afternoon hours of May 3rd. At approximately 522, Eggleston was sent a friend, sent a friend the invite to her baby shower which was scheduled for Sunday, May 7th. 
This Facebook message is the last known outgoing communication sent by Eggleston to anyone. An analysis of Robertson's cell site records on May 3rd indicates his phone was in the area near, near Eggleston's residence when he made and received the phone calls from 5.35 to 6.18 p.m. At 6.22, Robertson's phone begins to move away from the area around Eggleston's apartment. According to call detail records, the last activity on Eggleston's phone was an unanswered possible telemarketer's in call, incoming call at 6.57. At that time, Eggleston's phone was located in the same area in downtown Baltimore as Robertson's. After the incoming call, all activity ceased on Eggleston's phone, indicating her phone was disabled or turned off at that time. Investigators conducted an internet reverse image search and located the apartment featured in the photographs Robertson sent Eggleston. That residence was a completely different residence from the one Robertson made Eggleston believe they were moving into. Further, a Google account linked to Robertson was identified and records obtained via search warrant showed his account was created in 2010. And a review of the Google search history from October 14, 2017 revealed 18 distinct searches or links clicked regarding trash pickup, landfills, or dumpster pickups in Baltimore City. Specifically, searches were conducted on that day for where does Baltimore City trash go and when picked up, search twice, Baltimore City dumpster pickup, and Baltimore City landfill. The searches were conducted a few days after the media outlet aired a report on Eggleston's disappearance. Local and federal law enforcement have exhaustively investigated Eggleston's disappearance and any persons that may have been related. The totality of the evidence inculpates Mr. Robinson, Robertson. Although the state is not required to prove motive, our investigation confirmed, confirmed a volatile argument between Robertson and the mother of his children the night before Akia Eggleston disappeared following Eggleston's posting of a sonogram picture photograph on Facebook. Obviously, Mr. Robertson is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty and will certainly have his day in court. As many of you are already aware, I'm not able to go and talk beyond the four corners of the statement of probable cause, and I hope that you will understand that when it comes to questions. However, I hope that today's arrest brings some sense and some measure of hope in the first phase in our pursuit of justice for Akia Eggleston. Let me also say this to the people of Baltimore City. Our pursuit of justice is unyielding. We do not give up on the victims of crime in Baltimore City, ever. This case has been open for almost five years. In the past six months, we have used additional investigative techniques and given this case a committed set of fresh eyes. I want to thank especially Kurt Bjorklin, deputy over major crimes. Unfortunately, time and time again, We've seen the disparity of media coverage based on race, on the race of the victim. When you're white and missing, there's never a lack of media coverage. But when you're a young black pregnant woman that goes missing, it often hardly makes the news. I give a lot of credit to our prosecutors and especially our federal partners. And above course, the Baltimore Police Department. But I give a special thanks to the family of Akia Eggleston for never giving up in their pursuit of justice for Akia and her unborn child. Thank you for being here. I'll now turn it over to FBI Supervisory Agent Shane Bushwalk. Good morning. I'm Supervisory Special Agent Shane Buckwald with FBI Baltimore. This has been a long and painful journey for the family of Akia Eggleston. For nearly five years, the people of Baltimore have searched, hoped, and mourned with Akia's family and friends, but they never gave up, and neither did we. As Akia's face and story gained national attention, 
the FBI and Baltimore Police Department were working diligently behind the scenes. Although it's taken nearly five years, we never let this case go. In fact, a Kia Seeking for Information poster hangs in our office. It serves as a daily reminder to find justice for Akia and bring closure for her family. Today we stand here confident in the charges brought against Michael Robertson for the murder of Akia Eggleston and their unborn child. While her body still hasn't been recovered, we hope this arrest brings a level of comfort and closure to Akia's family. We appreciate the state's attorney's office, our partner, the Baltimore Police, FBI Detroit, and all of our law enforcement counterparts who helped bring closure in this case. We also thank the media and Akia's family for keeping this investigation on the forefront of everyone's mind for so long. While we know this arrest cannot undo the unimaginable damage that's been done to this family, we hope it serves as a reminder that time does not deter law enforcement efforts and our persistence to find truth and justice. Thank you for being with us today. I'll turn it back over to City State's Attorney, Marilyn Murphy. All right, our family members did want to address the media, um, and so we have uh, Kia's aunt, Zenobia Wilson, is going to come forward. Um, I just want to say thank you to the, the state prosecutor's office for continuing to help us um, during our time of need. And thank you to everyone for their thoughts and their prayers for um, keeping hope for our family that we would find her alive. Um, even though the evidence says something different, that she's not, um, we just want to say thank you and, and just to please continue to keep us in your prayers. Thank you. And this is um, Akia's stepdad, Sean Wilkinson. Um, again, on behalf of the family, uh, we would like to thank all of uh, the participants in Akia's case, ADA, Kurt Bajorklin, for his continued efforts, um, the efforts of the Baltimore City Police Department um, in the pursuit of justice for our loved one, Akia, and our grandson. Um, I'd like to thank the FBI for what they were to provide in the case in their pursuit of uh, justice. We'd also like to thank the law enforcement agencies of Michigan, as well as Baltimore City and the other law or legal enforcement agencies that help um, with the arrest of the assailant in our case. We also like to thank um, Black and Missing for their continued walk with us in uh, community relations and social media, um, getting a Kia's case um, spread throughout the world, international and national. We appreciate that. Um, we like to say domestic violence is real. And when it happens, we need to address it. It is not the answer, and there's always an alternative. The family seeks justice in Akia's case. It has affected so many relationships, and we will continue to stand united as a family until the final judgment in this case has been rendered. We thank you again. God bless. Thank you. Questions? Well, what we do, we try to support families when things like this happen. There's no book written on how to, which, how to proceed, what to do, and because of the experience that we, uh, that we have in doing this now, we, ju we just want to support the family. And I think that uh, we did that, and I hope the family is uh, happy with what we were able to uh, supply to them. Um, they're just, it's just a tragic thing that, that happens to families, and it never should happen. What is Robertson's believed motive in this case? He did 
didn't want a kid to have the child? Or what's the, the, the legal motive here? So again, I have to stick to the four corners of the, the statement of probable cause. And um, one of the things that we kind of have already highlighted is that there was some sort of contention among, among the two with reference to Akia having his child. The two, meaning uh, Robertson and Eggleston. Robertson and Eggleston and his other um, child's mother, children's mother. Inside the Cherry Hill home, was there any sign of a physical struggle? Is there any additional detail you all can provide in terms of? We have a very detailed statement of probable cause that I didn't read into the record that will be public record that you guys can, can use, OK? And if we need to provide that to you, we will. Would you be able to talk about the charge against uh, the charge for the unborn child and the decision there? I mean, I think it's obvious. She was eight months pregnant, and so the, the viability of that child was there, and so that is considered a life that was 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 lost as well. And can you guys, can you guys address? Um, the, first of all, has he always been a suspect? So I can't go into the investigation, but I can tell you that at the outset, and you can look at the statement of probable cause, very early on, he was considered a suspect. Understood. And I know this might be something you might not be able to touch on, but um, with regards to the length that the length of time it takes to build a case like this, it's been a long time. Can you explain for our viewers why it takes so long? So I think every case is different. In some instances, you know, in homicide cases, you'll have an investigation that will lead to a suspect right away, and in other cases, they don't. Sometimes you have circumstantial evidence, and sometimes you have direct evidence. Um, and so what I have been very clear about and what I read is that, you know, we used additional investigative techniques, and we had a new sort of fresh set of eyes that looked at the evidence um, and worked with our federal partners and BPD to really kind of overturn every sort of stone that was that we wanted to see where it led. And so with that fresh set of eyes and with those additional investigative techniques, I have to limit it to that, we were able to to ultimately conclude and, and make an arrest. Is Mr. Robertson still in Michigan or has he been extradited? I believe Kurt, do you know? If he, he's still in Michigan. He's in, he's in he's still in Michigan, but he's been he's been apprehended. Oh. Um, it's going to be some, uh, we don't have the details of the time. When he was captured, um, where was he? How did, how did you take him down? How did that go? Did he actually it was in Michigan, and I can just tell you that's where he had moved. And so that's where we, U.S. Marshals, working with our federal partners, <laughs> we were able to apprehend him there. Okay. So, uh, there's no reason to not be named in any way? No. Mm -mm. Do you all believe anyone else? At this stage of the investigation, we believe that um, he's the person of interest. Do you guys know when he moved to Michigan? How long after? Uh, I don't believe that's in the statement. Is it in the statement of probable cause? Um, moved, gonna, uh, you, late, can you step up? Sorry. Uh, Mr. Robertson moved uh, late of 2017 late with, of yes, with um, uh, Ms. Pomeroy, Hallie Pomeroy, who's the uh, mother of his two children. Okay, so can you speak about the mom? It, do you have any reason to believe that she may have known that he may have allegedly done something like this? We cannot go into that aspect of it. Again, it's open. We believe that we have a suspect that has been apprehended, but the investigation still continues, okay? Robertson, you know, how did you all feel about him as their relationship progressed? So, um, in my mind, he has always been a suspect in my mind. Um, the eyes are definitely were on him. And not saying that he may have not acted alone, but um, he's definitely been in our forefront eyes. We do believe that he he did it. He made her disappear. What, 
what is what's that information why do you think that he was involved? Well, um I can't give much details until they are released, but um we do have evidence that he definitely had a motive to not seeing this child be born. Um, he has multiple children, um, multiple, more, more than you can count on your hand, I'll say that. Um, so that definitely played a factor. Um, Did she ever express concerns about him? So, and I don't want it, please, I don't want to inundate them, so feel, you only have to answer what you feel comfortable well, answering and guys again and, and it's still open and pending investigation are there any other last questions what happens in terms of her search for the body so I, again this is still an open and pending investigation we believe that we have apprehended the suspect um and so i have to leave it there okay thank you thank you guys Thank you.